As you are turning there in your Bibles to Psalm 103, I um, imagine with me, think on this, if, if the Lord, if God the Father were to write you a personal letter, what would it say? What would God write to you? Uh, you, you open it up, and uh, obviously it's perfect penmanship, and you uh, are able to read. What does he say to you? Uh, it's what I've been thinking on this week as I've been uh, jumping into uh, Psalm 103. It got me thinking because... Um, if you know anything about my story, I didn't know my biological father uh, for the first 25 years of my life. Uh, he had left my mom before I was born, and so I never had any contact with him until I was 25. And at 25, uh, uh, my wife Angela and, uh, and I and our daughter Rachel were living in New Zealand, and uh, we, uh, through a number of different things, ended up uh, finding uh, my father and making contact with him, and uh, and he really knew very little about us. But he had sent a uh, is the first Christmas card I had ever gotten from my biological father uh, down in New Zealand, and, uh, and and so I remember reading it. And uh, one particular line was uh, John, Angela, and Rachel, you have made Christmas a lot more special uh, than it has ever been. Uh, and it's the first time I had been in contact with them. What do you, what do you write? What do you say? Uh, and, um, and so it's one of those very personal letters, but I recognize that my dad, he, he missed the first 25 years of my life. He, he really didn't know much about me at all. Uh, he, he knew what I had written to him. I was the first one to kind of make contact with him. I wrote him a letter, and I, what do you write to your father for the first time? Uh, it was um, basically just a story of, his, here's my story, here's my life. And, um, and so there began this dialogue, and uh, he was looking forward to uh, when we were going to return back to the States, and uh, he was looking forward to, to, to meeting me. <laughs> He really didn't know me all that well, uh, not well at all. What would God have written to me? Uh, he, he knew me. He knows me. What would he write? What would he write to you? What would, be, what would be God's tone in the letter that he writes to you personally? Again, not a letter to the church, but a letter to you. It has your name on it. It's written to you. What's the tone? Is the tone one of, uh, of, of invitation, of, of love, of uh, a closeness? Is, is it along those lines, gentle in tone? Or is it one that is, if you were to imagine that, is it more of a tone of, of um, disappointment? Do you feel like God maybe is ashamed of you? It's so shame is maybe a, a title that you would have. Or is it loving and, and inviting? What does it look like for you? Um, I ask that question because I believe that Psalm 103 is a letter that is written to his children. And, and this morning, it's going to answer that question, what would God write to you if he were to write you a letter? I think we're going to find it here in this, in this psalm. Uh, we're going to get the very heart of God, how he treats his children out of this psalm. I want to focus down onto verses 8 through 14 is where we'll spend the majority of our time in this psalm, but... Uh, to get the context of where we're starting, uh, let me read verses 1 through 7 for us. Here's what it says. Uh, Psalm 103, 
verse 1, and it's written by David, King David. We've looked at a number of psalms from him before. Of David, here it says, My soul, bless the Lord. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget his benefits. So he's, he's preaching to himself, he's speaking to himself for this moment, and he says, oh soul, don't forget about God, and, and bless his name. Just look at God, and here it comes. Verse 3, he forgives all your iniquity, all your sin. He heals all your diseases. Uh, and, and let me pause here for a moment. Um, heals all of your diseases. I don't want us to get confused and, and think that there's maybe something in the health, wealth, gospel type of, uh, I was going to say junk, but we'll call it garbage. Um, the, the, what does this mean? He, he heals all of your diseases. We could take this out of context. Many times in the Bible when we talk about diseases, it is definitely talking about physical healing. Context here, uh, I believe, is going to be painted for us here, the metaphor of diseases. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He forgives all your, your sin. He is, he is talking here about our sin. It's a beautiful metaphor, in fact, of sin, your diseases. Our diseases are, uh, they, they are debilitating, they are corrupt, they, our sins uh, cripple us. Your sins cripple you and break a, any ability to have a relationship with God. It, your, your diseases separate you from the, the Holy One. And, and so, here David is speaking who, who has experienced the forgiveness of God in Psalm 51. We looked at that earlier. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with a faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. We, we, we just sang that, right? Your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. And here we'll, we'll begin to, to narrow our focus down. What do you think about God? What you think about God is the most important thing that you will think about. Let me repeat that. What you think about God is the most important thing that you will think about. And I realize there's a lot that you can think about. There's, you have all kinds of different things. Oh, what, what's going to happen this afternoon? What's going to happen the, tomorrow? I go back to work and all these, all these pressures, all these concerns, all these things that you can be thinking on. The most important thing that you think about is what you think about God. It will affect all of those things, other things that you think about. I promise you. It affects all of that. And so we want to think rightly about God. Verse 8 is a great place for us to start. What do you think about God? Look what it says. The Lord, Yahweh, is, is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. <laughs> to be clear here in, in these verses, who is, 
who, who is the subject? Who is he writing to? So he's, he's writing about God, and, and it's, it applies to who? Who do these verses apply to? Well, we get the answer for that out of verses 11 and verse 13. So verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. You'll see that repeated in verse 13 as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. This applies to those who fear him. And that's a little bit of an archaic uh, kind of Bible-y way that we, uh, that the Bible describes those who follow him, uh, those who fear him. Well, what does that mean? We don't use that, that term, analogy, very often. Uh, we don't really use it in uh, in, in regular conversation. Uh, let me see if I can just quickly break that down a little bit. The fear of the Lord. What does that mean for those who fear the Lord? Uh, it is those who will come under the authority. They will humble themselves under the authority, under the almighty hand of God. Those who fear the Lord are those who humble themselves and commit to his way, not their own. This is, we make no mistake, we are all sinners. Uh, sinners, right? Uh, we, we talk about sin regularly. Uh, we need to understand sin. If we don't understand sin and understand that we're sinners, we really have, have no ability to to come under a heavenly father who is perfect in every way. Um, sinners, iniquity. In fact, verse 10, right? He has not dealt with us as our sins deserved, deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. Uh, our, our sin separates us from a holy God. Our sin, our, our establishing our own kingdom apart from God. When, when we say, I am going to do this, and I don't care what anybody else says, I don't care what God thinks, that's sin. Um, when, when we uh, go about um, doing our own will, that's sin. Missing the target, but it's missing the target of God's call for perfection. He is a holy God. He is absolutely perfect. And, and so sin separates us from a holy God. And what does that deserve of us? It deserves separation from him. It is deserving. It is right. It is just of God to separate us. So um, when we think about sin and, and being forgiven, it, it is, it, it's impossible for God to just say, oh, yeah, 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 you're sin. Oh, no, no, I know about that. The, don't worry about it. We're good. We're, we're all right. And so he just kind of poo-poos it and just, uh, there's, he can't just ignore sin. He can't ignore our, our iniquities that would not be just. It wouldn't be right for God to just say, oh, don't worry about it. Forget it. No, there needs to be a punishment, a, a penalty for sin, for iniquities, for our going our own way. And so, make no mistake, we are sinners, but the gospel is for sinners. Uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 15, it says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If you are a sinner. You are a, you, you recognize that you are a sinner. You, you come under the only one who can save you, who can rescue you. Now, there are some of you sitting here, or, or those that maybe are online, there are some who would maybe acknowledge kind of like, oh yeah, no, I've had sin in my life, but you really don't think of your much, you don't think of yourself much as a sinner. Uh, you you're not as bad as that guy. Uh, and so you can easily talk yourself out of the fact that, I mean, God generally would see you as, uh, you're not all that bad. Better than them, 
maybe not as good as them, but you're not all that bad. Of course God would accept you. If that is your thinking, you completely miss the fact of how egregious, how desolate your sin makes you from a holy God. The gospel has not yet been for you. The gospel is for sinners. You see, uh, three words for the gospel. Jesus saves sinners. If you're not much of a sinner, what do you need to do? The gospel is for sinners. And and he, he rescues sinners. How are you? But look how he treats those who are his. Those who have the fear of the Lord, who have come under him, who have humbled themselves to recognize they are sinners. They have been awakened by God. I am a sinner and I come under him. We saw it. Verse 10. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. What I deserve is separation from a holy God. And yet, he didn't repay me as I deserve. According to my sins, he he didn't repay me. The justice, the penalty, the, the wrath of God was in fact, what's due me, what's due you, sinner, was poured out on who? Jesus. The Son of God, the perfect one, has the penalty put upon him for your sin and mine. There's justice. So so we see the the hand of God and and the the work of his love and, and verse 14, for he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. He He knows your frame. He created you. He knows you. And he he loves you. He he the word knows is the Hebrew word yada. It is a it's a word of intimacy. He knows you. He knows exactly everything about you. He knows that you when it says remembering that we are dust, he, he, he knows that you have no ability on your own to make it all happen. You have no ability on your own to get it all right. Um, here's how this works practically. Um, and this is, this is where things get so countercultural. We, we have in our culture a sense, a feeling like we are omniscient. Uh, thanks to the advent of the uh, World Wide Web, also known as the Internet and Google and all these different things, we get the feeling, we would never say that we're omniscient, but we can get the feeling in our culture like we, we figure this out, we got this, we know this, oh, we know all these different things, and God says, um, no, <laughs> you, you, you don't know, you are, you are like dust, dust, and off it go- it has no strength it has nothing in itself you are not omniscient and you are not another countercultural thing today is you are not omnipotent uh you are not all powerful and you are not omniscient uh you are um, are not omnipresent you are not everywhere we get the feeling like i can just i can be there i can be there overnight i can be anywhere i can i, I have the connection all around no he knows that you, uh, and I gave this gift to, to you uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, let me repeat it uh, in case you missed it or in case you've forgotten and you forget that you're like dust. Um, you, me, we are finite. Isn't that wonderful? Um, uh, you, this is freeing to realize that you have limits. 
you can't do it all. You can't have it all. You can't get everything. You cannot accomplish it all. You are finite. You have to say no. You, you have to make choices and you want to, if you are in Christ, you will align yourself with how the Lord has laid that out for us. You are finite. And that is a gift. And so incredibly counter to our culture. You have to be all of that. So all the guilt, all the shame that comes today with trying to accomplish far more than you were ever, ever intended to accomplish, you can't do it. But I know the one who can. (laughs) And so, look how he moves toward us. The the very heart of God and how the heart of God moves toward us. Verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. This is his, his heart. Do you hear how he moves toward you? He moves toward you. Um, How much does he love you? As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. Tonight, I, I... I encourage you to, uh, to tonight to go uh, step outside and find a star. Just find any star. And as far as the heavens are, this, this metaphor is this beautiful picture. As far as the heavens are from where you are to the earth. And it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. His love for you is greater than that distance. He moves toward you. He loves you. But what about all the sin? What about the iniquity? What about how the sin that so pollutes your life? Verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? Well, let me start with this. If we are anywhere, anywhere on the globe here and you, you move north, you will eventually come and you will hit a, a pole. It's a white and red pole that kind of has this sparkly stuff. It's the north pole. You will eventually hit that. And then if you continue in that direction, you will start moving south. And you will eventually hit the South Pole. And, and then you will hit that and you'll continue in that same direction. You'll start moving north. Opposite. If you move east, and as you start moving and you start going in that direction, at what point will you start moving west? Never. (laughs) Uh, Science, uh, this is a free science uh, lesson here, right? Go the opposite direction. Go west and you keep going. You will never start going east unless you stopped and turned around. This metaphor is beautiful. How far has God removed the, the penalty of your sin if you are in Christ? How far? Infinitely. There is, there is no place where you will be able to... Uh, it is infinite. As far as the east is from the west. He, he's removed an infinite distance, the penalty of your sin. His forgiveness, in other words, is total. It, it is, it, it's not just Half. There is nothing in the gospel, in the Bible, that says, you do your part, he'll just care for the rest. Or uh, he will save you, and now it's up to you to get on the performance treadmill and just make it happen from here on. It It is holy and fully on him, because of him, by him alone. He forgives you. 
It's unconditional. It's complete. Here's, here's what I know. Th- there is a disconnect many times for us. We, we mentally, if you've been, especially if you've been in church world for a while, you hear of words of, uh, of, of grace, of love, of mercy, and uh, God's forgiveness, and we go, oh yes, I totally agree. And so we get that in our minds, but there's a disconnect sometimes to what does that actually mean? mean for you i get he saves people yeah and he saved me i i get that but what does that look like let me let us go to just one story uh out of the bible here of 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 what it looks like when god's grace is poured out Uh, when god's mercy is poured out on another um the, the picture that it has for us as well. Turn over to the left. We're going to leave here in Psalm 103 and turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's a ways over. 2 Samuel chapter 9 is where you want to go. And as you're turning there, it's a reminder a story here of King David, in fact, the same one who wrote Psalm 103. This is a part of his story. David's kindness, a beautiful picture for us. Let me read just the first three verses for us. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, David asked, Is there anyone remaining from the family of Saul? I can show kindness to or to for Jonathan's sake. There was a servant of Saul's family named Ziba. They summoned him to David and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? I am your servant, he replied. So the king asked, Is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can go, that I can show the kindness of God to? Ziba said to the king, There is still Jonathan's son, who was injured in both feet. Now, a little bit of context. David is now the king. Before him is King Saul, and Saul has a son named Jonathan. Jonathan and David are best of friends. Saul and Jonathan end up going to war, and they get killed. David has now come in, and it's, a new, in a sense, a new dynasty that has, has taken in customarily, you would come in and you would eliminate anybody from the previous dynasty. You would, you, would, you would execute them all. So you make sure that you protect your, uh, your, your, your reign, your throne. Uh, we can understand that to some degree uh, today in our political world. Uh, in America, right, when there's a new political party that comes in, a new president, we... Well, maybe they want to execute the other ones, but uh, there is a, uh, a, a whole new regime that comes in. They replace everybody and will rule for the next four to eight years. And, and, so, and then there's another turnover. So we, we can kind of wrap our minds around that idea. So customarily, that's what happens. But David was friends with Jonathan and David made a promise to Jonathan, if anything happens, know that I will care for your family. And so David asks, is there anyone that I can show God's kindness to? God's kindness. Uh, It's the Hebrew word chesed. Uh, We've we've talked about that a number of times in this series of Psalms. It's God's loving kindness. It is unmerited favor toward you, his, his grace, his mercy that's poured out on you. Whether able or unable, qualified, unqualified, worthy, unworthy, is, is there anybody that I can show God's kindness to? And so Ziba's response, well, there is, but, um, but, but David, you need to know 
uh, there's this one son from Jonathan, but he's, he's crippled in both feet. He's, he's lame. Uh, it's probably not going to look all that good in your court to, to have him around. Um, you get the sense in here of, eh, don't, don't sweat it too much, David. And here's the beautiful thing about God's kindness. This is something we want to understand, church. God's kindness is not picky. God's kindness is it's an unmerited, unearned favor that is poured out, an unearned love that is poured out. It is God's kindness. It's, it's one-sided. It operates uh, regardless of the response and the ability of the individual to, to return. It's God's kindness. It's love. Verse 4, the king asked him, where is he? Ziba answered the king, you'll, you'll find him in Lodabar at the house of Makir, son of Emil. So King David had him brought from the house of Makir, son of Emil, in Lodabar. Uh, Lodabar, uh, not exactly a place that any of us would, would go. Uh, we, we almost lose the, the meaning of where Lodabar is because uh, Lodabar, I don't, did I even say that right? Lo, no, Dabar, no pasture, no pasture land. Uh, there's no pasture land. In other words, Lodabar is a desert wasteland. There's, there's no resorts there. It is a desert wasteland. You know what comes to my mind? Do you ever head towards uh, California and as you, there is the old water park they try to build up there and it's just all graffiti and all. It's a, it's a wasteland. Who would ever live there? This guy did. Lodabar. Uh, it's, a, it's a place that charm forgot about. It's distant, in the middle of nowhere. No one goes to Lodabar. It's the kind of place you would hide out. It's it's also a beautiful picture. It is a very appropriate picture of sin, of a life living in sin. Lodabar. A a place of, uh, of distance, a wasteland. Sin separates us from a good, holy God. Gracious God. It's, it's rebellion against God. Sin is, right? Sin is a state of corruption, of vileness, of barrenness, of filthiness. And we have all sin and fall short of God's call. And we have all lived there. Some of you live there now. Lodabar. Notice up to this point, we don't even know this kid's name. (laughs) When he's mentioned, he's just mentioned as, well, he's the cripple. (laughs) He's the lame one. Verse 6. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell face down, and paid homage. David said, Mephibosheth, I am your servant, he replied. Get this, you know what, here's what Mephibosheth means. Shame. Mephibosheth. Shame. I wonder, I wonder how many of you can maybe identify with that name. What comes to your mind is, when you think of you, shame. You struggle in this world of shame. Shame. 
At this point, I think Mephibosheth thinks he, he's, he's toast. He's done. <laughs> Customary in the life. He, he prostrates himself. He, he, he lays his crutches down. And the future is in the hands of the king. Verse 7. Don't be afraid, David said to him, since I intend to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all your grandfather Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. What, what you just read there is an adoption. This, this incredible account of an adoption. There is absolute grace that is poured out on this Mephibosheth, this, this lame one. This is a rags to riches story. In fact, further on, you will always eat meals at my table. Last line we just read there, three more times it says you will eat at my table. Out of the four, three of them, it says always Eat at my table. You will always eat meals at my table. You will be in the presence of the king. You are invited in. And what does he have to be able to give? What can he do? Mephibosheth's response. Mephibosheth paid homage and said, What is your servant? that you take an interest in a dead dog like me. <laughs> I, I think we can maybe get a really clear picture of a view of how Mephibosheth thinks of himself. <laughs> He's probably been kicked around all of his life. Pretty useless. Crippled. He's lame. It's not much use. Why would you even pay any attention to me, king? You, you obviously don't know me. You see my condition? I, I, I can never pay you back. This isn't a, a dead dog like me. I wonder, can you accept God's grace to you? Have you received his love? Have you received his grace? Mephibosheth has done nothing to earn it. He, he can never repay it. He can't live up to all that. Neither can we. This is what's so amazing about God's love. And, and he, he freely pours it on. Look at the rest of this chapter and see how this is demonstrated by David, God's kindness. Verse 9, Then the king summoned Saul's attendant Ziba and said to him, I have given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and his family. You, your sons, and your servants are to work the ground for him, and you are to bring in the crops so your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will, is always to eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, and Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do all the Lord the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Just like him. Adopted. Verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. All those living in Ziba's house were Mephibosheth's servants. Verse 13, however, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. His feet 
had been injured. He, he never goes back to Lodabar. The more that he receives of, of God's love, the, the further Lodabar becomes on the rearview mirror. I, I love the picture that is painted here and how Chuck Swindoll in his book on David uh, described the scene. The setting is the palace of King David. Gold and bronze fixtures gleam from the walls. Lofty wooden ceilings crown each spacious room. In the banquet room, David and his children gather for an evening meal. Absalom, tanned and handsome, is there, as is David's beautiful daughter, Tamar. The call to dinner is given, and the king scans the room to see if all are present. One figure, though, is, is absent. Clump, scrape, clump, scrape. The sound coming down the hall echoes through the chamber. Clump, scrape. Um, scrape. Finally, the person appears at the door and slowly shuffles to his seat. It is the lame Mephibosheth, seated in grace at David's table, and the tablecloth covers his feet. Now the feast can begin. What a picture. That's us, crippled. Unwanted by society, and yet he, the king, wants you. He wants you to dine with him. Always the table. That's the king. picture of God's love snatching us from a barren place, a dry, desolate life of sin, and sitting us down to eat in the presence of the King. Do you know God's love? Have you been trying to earn it? You will never earn it. You can never pay it back. How are you defined? What labels are attached to you? What does God think of you? For all who are in Christ, you are now at the table of the King. And the tablecloth covers your feet. Do you remember where we started? I began to, by asking you if, if God were to write you a personal letter, what would it say? What would his letter say to you? I think we have it here in Psalm 103. A letter that is written to his children. I, if, if you will, I, I took the liberty to, uh, to, to, to take verses 8 through 14 and, and write them in first-person pronoun uh, as, as though the Lord is writing them to me. Um, here's what it says. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. I will not always accuse or be angry. I have not dealt with you as your sins deserve or repaid you according to your iniquities. 
for I know what you are made of, remembering that you are dust. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is my faithful love toward those who fear me. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. As a father has compassion on his children, so I have compassion on you who fears me. Here is God's love letter to you. The one who knows you, who cares about you, 